in a prayer with us. It's interesting to note that we do that every day in camp. And that outside of camp there seem to be lots of different ideas of what happens for Indian people when we gather together in such extraordinary numbers under such extraordinary circumstance. So we're really thankful we had the opportunity for a few of us to come and get a meal. <laughs> and come and have a visit, as we would say. We hope that um, it's something we'd like to continue. I did want to mention a, a couple of things, because they put a microphone up here. <laughs> Big mistake. Uh, <clears throat> on the 4th of December, we're trying to have a very large interfaith gathering in the camp by clergy and congregation. It's not lost on us that there's not too many congregation here, and we know there's some intrepid feelings about what it might be to actually pray together. But on the 4th of December, uh, led by um, Oral Looking Horse, will be a very, very large, massive interfaith prayer and gathering, because that's, that's its origin. Uh, so I would like you to send that out to your networks. And we thought about this. We thought maybe it would be good to start small and come and visit with local community. Let people know that you know we have various ways of praying, but we do like to get together. Uh, on, on the fourth of December, we'll start our. We'll be trying to start for a um, eleven o'clock in the morning time, and it'll continue uh, until the afternoon. So we'll be trying to do that. Some will do a sunrise ceremony, and others will come for the later mer uh, morning ceremony. But we'd like to share that with many from different faiths. And we'd like you to ask your congregations to join us. And afterwards, we will feed you. Depending on how the hunting season is going. So, so I'm really thankful that we had this opportunity in a small way. Um, twice today, Karen's referred to me as a leader, which is probably incorrect. We just kind of do things in a small way as common people. And it takes a lot of hands to make a camp that's based on that you know, activity, on the prayer activity, stay together. You might wonder how that works down there, or you might have had a question, and we we'll welcome those questions. We'd like to keep making those spaces where that's possible. We'd like to invite some of your friends and family and congregation. We're hoping that some other churches in the area will act as a, um, as a host, maybe each Sunday. We're happy to come in and see your services and help you know, bring some of those from ours and, and come together and do that. I think dispelling the myths and dispelling the rumors and dispelling the, um, it's 2016, you know, we still don't know a lot about each other sometimes. And me, like many, I'm a visitor, I'm from South Dakota, so that means I'm, I'm very aware that I'm here in the northern country and want to try to do things in a manner that's reflective of how we act when we go as visitors. And, and your graceful way of acting as hosts in your own community. So, if anybody wanted to know anything, I'm happy to try and get someone else to give you an answer. <laughs> Otherwise, we hope to have an invitation and we'll work at it for next Sunday and continue a cycle where we come together and we'll bring. We have, we know we were told it was limited space, so we tried to <clears throat> uh, limit how many people came this time. We had a lot of the. No, we didn't. <laughs> We unfortunately just pointed at people and said, you, 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 and you. Actually, no, we made it by invitation. So the next time, if we have bigger space, we'd like to invite more, and we'd like to invite your, your friends and family and community to come. And we would like to bring more things of how we celebrate this extraordinary journey we call life. So, thank you.
That, that's a very good question. In, in this camp, there are treaty meetings. People are discussing and teaching about what it means to be on 1851 treaty land. Right now, it's in the hands of Army Corps of Engineers. It's Army Corps land in terms of the broken treaty. That treaty goes back to 1851, and there were changes to it over time. Um, where, they're, <clears throat> where they're drilling is core land, but it's also surrounded by uh, areas that we call, all of it actually, taken land. So it's in dispute. It's been in dispute for a long, long time. Uh, well, since 1851. Um, if we revert back to an understanding of how to negotiate what that means, it means that those conversations have to continue and the process by which those conversations have happened from then until now have to be reviewed. But as you may know, that's not exactly convenient for the oil companies that want to drill the pipeline under the water. So I think it's interesting, particularly for those who live here, in Bismarck and in Mandan to know that that's been a conversation people have been asking for mm, since 1851. Well, 1851 and a half, I think, when they broke the... <coughs> but there is more information, and you're welcome to um, uh, call into our call center at camp. No, I'm kidding. We don't call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish we did. Uh, we'd like to get some more information on the website that's called hochetichakwinkamp.org. Um, we, we have some information there where you might learn something, but actually I would invite you to, um, to come into camp because there are, there are meetings around this all the time where people are discussing and trying to understand what it is that we can bring back to the larger community that says we recognize there, there have been long-standing injustice. So I have to make an announcement for... Um, Brother Moshi, he likes to be called Brother. He also reminded me that um, on the 27th of November is the 5,000 5, days, you're saying? Yes, day 5,000 of the Simple Peace Vigil. Right, there you it's go. It's going to be November 27th, <clears throat> Sunday, and my prayer is that we could have one celebration of it here and one at the camp in the afternoon. There you go, that would be the 27th. Yeah. of November. And may I make one comment about the young lady? I come, I come from Iran originally. Now, people who come from the Middle East and other Asia and Africa have understood colonialism doesn't, it may decide, yeah, for now, in order to take over your land, we may have some kind of a treaty with you or with somebody. Later, since you are savages and we are the civilized, we're going to say, oh, we're not going to pay attention to, to what we agreed to because we agreed on something to not somebody at our own level of humanity, but you are like animals. It's like the, the way colonialism looks at people in of people of color, if you will, is there are savages, they are, they are like animals. So yeah, you may, you may want to, uh, in order to achieve your next objective, colonial objective, you just, yeah, if they, if, even if they, in, in Iran, they actually signed treaties, and then they abrogated. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that it is illegal, immoral, I mean, and wrong, and against any organized or not organized religion. Mm -hmm. It has to do with brutal racist power mm -hmm. doing what it wants to do and you're just a poor victim. I hope this helps. Yeah, it does. <coughs> I mean, it just lets me, it, it just reinforces what I already knew. So it's unfortunate. But. The fact that it is illegal, who cares? They, did, they didn't care. Go on bargaining in poor faith. <laughs> Anybody else want to ask anything? Or I still have a voice? I was losing my voice yesterday. I think um, I'd just like to say that the reason we do this from a prayerful place, from a prayerful stance, is because actually that that supersedes all those other things. And uh, the recognition that you, you all have made for us to be here, on my behalf anyway, to 
each and every one of you is a, is a heartfelt thank you. I think we can keep doing that. I think it's not impossible. It's not uh, outside of the realm of possibility. But I know also that there's um, misplaced fear about what it means to be prayerful people because we have different ways to do that. I think the idea that you'll find if you come visit a camp, uh, check in at the gate, you can just ask for my name and I'll try to bring you over. <laughs> that doesn't happen. I'm sorry. Uh, is that, that they were trying to find many ways to share that. And when you look now, for me, extraordinarily so, so many people have arrived from all over. So many people unexpectedly, not planned for, you know, sort of almost reactive because that original prayer call was so strong and it keeps going around and around and around the world. But here in our local, local areas, sometimes it gets a little confusing. We're trying to build a relationship with, uh, with Standing Rock and Cannonball, for example, to send some of the expertise from camp to help fix the showers and the toilets and maybe redo their kitchen. Because there's a lot of people in camp that have all kinds of, all kinds of talents. And we'd like to do that here as well, so that the rest of your congregations that didn't come with you today might be okay about understanding that, in fact, we make those spaces because we choose to do that together. When we do that together, we make some understandings together of what it means to be a human being, what it means to come together. And for us, the basis of understanding is, as I was told by, um, by a lot of the elders and by Orville Looking Horse and others who said, you know, make sure we make those spaces where those prayers happen so we can start to dispel some of that and have at least the basis by which we recognize each other. From there, pretty much I, I kind of feel there's something we can't be able to Asking our leaders to leave some space where we can have some genuine uh, conversation about what will happen to our resources, to our water, you know, to all the things that we need in order to have this for our children, our grandchildren, and those who still, you know, haven't been born and need an opportunity. That's on our shoulders. So I think that's the basis by which we do that. Anything else? Yes. What is going to happen? Uh, I heard, let me, let me start this. I heard on NPR a report about the camp. And the, uh, the, the byline of the report was, well, the Obama has said that the oil is going to be, the, the pipeline is going to be rerouted, and the New York Times had an op-ed to that effect. And then the byline of the, the NPR dispatch was, we're going to wait until this encampment runs its course. Yeah, I heard that. Could yeah. you talk to what are the plans of, because they are waiting for people to give up. No, no, no. We don't stop. Stop. We're trying to wait until we have uh, more than 10,000 people, and then we're going to start moving into man then. Today we were most riotous <laughs> together. And now we're going to go back to our cabin and say, gee, all those multi faith people, they're really rioters. <laughs> so I can answer by saying what I read and what I heard and what I know has been discussed. There are two different very uh, courses for this pipeline. The original course did not go through across Standing Rock and then through Indian Country. It went through non-Indian Country, but there were enough people with voices and money who said, we're not sure if that's the place you want to go. And there was also a sense of the continued oppression of First Nations peoples through eminent domain that said if we go through there, they shouldn't be able to stop us because we can say it's in the national interest. There are people also who have actually been paid to allow pipeline to go across their lands. That's a matter by which uh, our representatives will vocalize for us something that's going to impact or could impact all of us. I think what Obama was saying then, as I read it, was that he would like to see considerations and conversations continue for a number of weeks because we know when he said that there was a hearing coming. The hearing is about granting easement to the pipeline from the Army Corps. And if they grant that easement in terms of federal law, 
it gives them the right then to put their pipeline under the river. It does not give that right in terms of Indian law, in terms of Czechish Sakoin law, the Seven Council Fires, or in terms of 1851 treaty law. So there's a little bit of disparity in whose idea of what that is. And I think the only question that I understand uh, listening to tribal council and listening to the original statements was that people were asking to be a part of that conversation and not for there to be an assumption that it was okay because it isn't okay. It's not okay because, as we've learned now, all of us, empirical evidence, they call it. New Orleans said they planned for a thousand year event and with what happened with Katrina. The tankers they build, that there are super tankers going across our oceans. Does anyone have any idea how many super tankers are crossing the oceans every day with oil and petroleum products? As far as last I heard, at any given time, there are some 700, 800 super tankers crossing the oceans with all this oil. The worst part about it is, if you don't know this, they don't want to use clean uh, uh, petroleum products to drive in our cars. They still pollute. They use the lowest level, like the tar sand oil that they want to send across, and they pollute larger than any given city in the world. The largest pollution right now has no jurisdiction because all those waters are international waters. So people have made laws where four miles out, generally, they have to switch to a cleaner burning fuel in order to go into port. But when they're outside on the ocean, they don't have to do that. There are no laws. So that means the largest pollution that we have right now uh, into our atmosphere is from all the ships that are crossing. And normally, like I say, a lot of them are carrying petroleum products. So I think Obama was saying that he wanted to see what happens before this hearing, and then afterwards that he also was making it aware that he knew that there was always a, a different route than the one that's been chosen at this time. However, I think um, uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Governor's Task Force I wanted to go in the easiest manner for them because they're trying to meet their shareholders, investors, time. <coughs> they only have so much time to meet that, uh, and they only have a few clauses that allow them, if they go past their agreed building time, their contracted time, that allows them to continue. Part of that is what they call um, acts of nature. If their work was interrupted, meaning snow, rain, mud, something like that, they can get new funding that allows them to continue. The other part of it is if they are caught in an area that, where there are riots. Thus you see the language in your local papers about riotous people, because they needed to be a riot in order to get refunded. If you can hold this space, which is being required, until such time as that hearing ends and before their next uh, hearing for their investors, which is um, 1 January, I believe, that means they will then lose the funding for this if they don't meet certain lengths of pipeline by that time which is an interesting thing. I don't hear anybody talking about it in the press. But certainly it's easier to call people riotous than it is to, uh, to look at you know, what's actually going on in the So that's how I would answer that, that we know there are things coming in these next few years. What, are, what is the best scenario? And what's the worst scenario? Our best scenario is to keep a very prayerful space and keep inviting our relatives uh, to join us in that space. That's our best scenario. Because all of us have that opportunity, you know, in our <coughs> congregations and in our, in our, in our own families, uh, from the places that we have that we can send in our networks, you know, to ask for that space that says we have some questions. We're not sure, it's clear that this is good for us or good for our future, good for our grandchildren, good for, you know, generations to come. That's supposed to be something we do collectively, not something we do a handful of us on behalf of the others. So. I think that's our best case scenario. <coughs> Anybody else like to ask something or have a comment or observation about us riotous people? <laughs> Not about masks. I just have a little question. Um, well, I was out to the camp once, and I noticed that there's some four-legged friends that you guys have. <coughs> Donations. We've donated food. We've donated paper products. Would you? Would it be a waste of our time to donate dog food? Because I know there's dogs out there. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> I know they're not hungry, no, but, but do you need dog food? No. no? I think uh, what we've been asking people to do, in fact, if they can't take care of their animals, is to not bring them to camp. Okay. In fact, there's a traditional sense of not having dogs in certain areas. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have brought their dogs, and some need them, but not everyone needs them. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So but there is food there. Okay. Of course. 
Horses, horses, horses need stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Horses yeah. need hay. Horses need tack. Horses need um, you know to make sure we have water. Horses need brushes and stuff. Salt licks, salt licks. I brought, I brought four salt licks uh, the last time I came out myself. <coughs> Solar water troughs that we can keep warm. It gets cold, everybody from there knows what that's going to be like. So we're trying to get some uh, straw bales and hay bales. If you know local people who would like to both support and we support in return, uh, back to them, we'd like to be able to source. Um, uh, straw bale and hay bale that we can use for the horses and for some uh, elders and others so we can make those structures a little bit warmer. They have to be temporary structures under Army Corps rules and regulations, so we're trying to do things that will help people stay warm should we need to keep staying there through, uh, through January 1st and beyond. Yes, please. Can you, can you share a little bit how is it possible to have the National Guard and militarized police from seven different states in this tiny uh, location. How is, that, how is that possible on the one hand? And then on the other hand, if you want mind sharing, what has been the response of the people, not from seven different states, but from all over the planet to come and support us? As the state and corporations scale, escalate their violence, how is that other escalation of love and fearlessness and truth? You know, it's interesting to ask me something that I can't tell you because I've basically been in camp, so I don't get to get outside of camp. Most of you may not know, uh, there's only one little spot where people can get a tiny bit of signal to try and make communications. It's been known now as Facebook Hill. Facebook <laughs> Hill. Yeah, and Media Hill. That's also been known as the uh, the new prayer paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> so I try not to do that. I'm not on Facebook. But on the truth, it's too hard to try and get that signal. So what you're asking is something that we have to understand, particularly in resources that are outside, to have the courage to do the research that's necessary to get some real answers. So for example, the governor's task force that brought together the various law enforcement agencies has uh, a, a lot of money behind it. That's obvious because there are people standing on the other side of the, um, the uh, defense, you know, where we're trying to defend the water, who have a lot of gear. You know, they have all the latest things. I know the rhetoric for some years in my own understanding has been about uh, fear, has been about distrust. It's, uh, it's been about things that are trying to get us or take things from us. And yet when I look at it rationally, and I, I don't want to say this too much because I don't want to uh, get myself in trouble, but I've just spent quite a number of years teaching in universities and trying to ascertain where the truth lies in terms of how much we need to worry about each other or about those some, somebody from the outside is going to take. However, when that happens, you can see that people go through an immense amount of training, which means dollars somewhere have been given in order to gear up people with the latest in technology, with the latest in, uh, in fashion, because you know, masks <laughs> and shields and you know, what do they call those outfits, the whole thing? <laughs> yeah, tactical. You can't even see their faces or anything. You know, and weaponry, uh, tear gas, and uh, some uh, pepper spray. Some cannons. Yeah. yeah. So, extraordinarily, you know, we're, we're the other people on the inside of the camp don't have access to those things and aren't trying to get access to those things. But sometimes, when you're praying and you find yourself in trouble, it's kind of hard to mm -hmm. keep that stance. But I gotta say something that you all should know. Those of you who are, are, are from this area, maybe not aware, it was youth that started this. It was youth who ran, who said, for us, enough is enough. It was youth who said, what are you going to leave us if things continue in this way? So it was youth who started you know, that original idea that we need to start challenging ourselves and our older people. Some of us who are old enough in this room remember the 1960s buttons that said, question authority, don't trust anyone over 30. Yeah. Act, act, uh, or think global, but act local. These are things that another generation now are picking up as well. And as I was in some of those things, well, I'm not that old, but 
close to it. Oh, I watched it on TV. That's it. As I'm aware of some of those things that have happened, I see younger people having to go through the same questions. What will we have? We have finite resources. There's a finite amount of water that we all need in order to live. So I think there's a great question on their behalf, and it's challenged us all to have to seek a way to try and address inequity. And guess what? It's an equity for everyone that lives here too, because you get your water from here as well. So I think that's just the main thing that can answer how it is others gear up and have access to funds that do that. Now, I don't want to stand up here lecturing, but I'll tell you, if you follow the money, what it costs to have that many police from that many different states with that much equipment, you'll find out what's, you know, what's driving, what's behind an ability to do that. It has to come from a number of places. There are only so many funding sources for uh, L LEAs and LEOs, law enforcement agencies, and their officers to get that training and to get that equipment. And if they're water protectors and we're so peaceful, why do they require that living alone from oh. oppression? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. If we could just protect water and pray, all of us, then maybe. And that's what we're asking for December 4th, for clergy and congregation to know that we're just asking to, to defend the right to have water and defend the right to have that conversation. But we're going to try and do it in a peaceful, prayerful manner. That's our intention. That, that are the words that you'll see. That is what Standing Rock has been saying all along. And I think it's important because... Again, nobody planned for or had advance notice or knew that we'd get to the stage it is, and yet people are still struggling to maintain a peaceful space. It takes a lot of you guys to think about it in your own communities and in your own families, how easy it is for someone to push you over the line and get you angry. And here we are down there with no major incident, because people are still returning to that place. Pretty extraordinary. Did you have a question? Or? No, I was thumbs up. Um, there's a lot of people all over the world watching you right now, Johnny. For people that can't come to people that can't come to camp, what's the best kind of support that they can offer right now? And then for people that can come to camp, what kind of information would you give to them ahead of coming to camp so they can be a valuable part of the community and not drain the limited resources that are there right now? You know, that's a very big question. I mean, that, that has a lot of components, so let's try to make it simple. Firstly, anybody anywhere can pray. Anyone anywhere can go in their own local community to their own clergy of their own faith and ask questions about what does it mean to try and, you know, see each other, recognize each other, and make a prayer that recognizes the importance of doing that. And it's happening. It's going around the places where there's some recognition. However, we don't have mainstream media or those things, and it's not a story. It's not a story that a hundred people came together and had peaceful prayer, something to eat, and then sat around visiting afterwards. It doesn't sell newspapers, and it doesn't get much sound bites. But it could. It could do that. When enough of us do it, when enough of us say, hmm, maybe next time we'll have a larger structure, because there will be 500 of us. That's how it works. In terms of camp, camp is everywhere. All the people who are in this camp have come from other camps. You know, knowing what camp we come from and, and the value of looking after our own members and recognize them in our own camp is only the strength that, that happens to support for those who are in Ochecha Sharkoyin camp and those who are living nearby. You guys up here and also, you know, Standing Rock and home Papa people. Um, some of it's pretty simple in terms of value structure. If we go somewhere as guests and we're visiting, we bring something for our hosts. We try and make sure that we brought more than what we needed so we could give gifts, and we make sure we left it in better condition than we found it. Right now, there are a lot of people arriving who don't understand what North Dakota winter is going to be. They don't understand uh, what it means to be prepared. I heard a lot of discussions lately about <coughs> self-sufficiency, but self-sufficiency excludes others. We were, we're talking about being more than self-sufficient. We're talking about being you know, having the ability to come to help others, not just ourselves. So if you know people who are wanting to come to camp, then go and visit the ochetishatkoyincamp.org website. It's forced to be made, this website, because so many people have so many questions and want so many things. Um, the rest of the time, everybody who's there 
You know, we're asking everyone to work together. We have to do that every day because, as all of you know, winter is coming. Yeah. <laughs> as they say, and it's not a buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else has anything they want to ask? But there's lots of people here who can answer questions. <laughs> Um, could you speak to the value of maintaining the camp through the rough winter months ahead? What, what that what that possibly could mean in terms of being noticed? Or? Sure. As soon as the blizzard and the whiteouts come, no one will see us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, there's a group of people who came from California, and they really wanted to bring their idea of what it meant to be in camp, as many people are trying to do. We're asking people to recognize, firstly, that the home pop of people and Standing Rock are going to be here. And there are, you know, for us, there are our host and we're visitors. That's a hard thing to, to get our heads around. Secondly, then, there are communities like Mandan and Bismarck and Solon and others right nearby. We also want to make sure we have relationship and cannonball. Um, and beyond that, I think that um, it's hard to imagine from someone else's perspective what it is that we need to consider. So for example, the people from California <clears throat> brought a big white dome. And they really wanted to construct this big white dome. And we had some talks and we, you know, they met with other people and I tried to uh, have them speak with others in the camp who were trying to arrange for winter, as you asked. But they put up this big white dome. Uh, and I think, what, two days ago or something, when the big fog bank hit in the mornings, which happens here quite often, where they have the meeting space, no one can find it. <laughs> People were walking around the whole morning going, does anyone know it? <laughs> Indian people wouldn't put up a white dome. <laughs> where we know that the fog is going to roll in. So in preparation for winter, there are people there. People from here, from North Dakota, who are very aware of the things that are needed in order to give the most amount of resources to the most amount of people with the least amount of, of effort. But when um, calls go out like this one, uh, often many, many people come and they're unprepared. So we know, and I'm from South Dakota, but those who are from here know that it can get extraordinarily cold, that the wind is going to blow, you know, extraordinarily hard, that the temperature with that wind factor can be uh, bone chilling. And when we're not prepared, you know, it makes it a little bit hard. So we're going to try and organize that. We can use some help. There is the website, as you've seen, and that's a place to go and get information. There are camps there that are, are, that are trying to maintain for a larger structure. But um, I don't know if you've noticed, but people are still arriving, even at this last date. So I think the next one we'll have to deal with is, what is Thanksgiving? Don't that be fun? <laughs> <laughs> Something? I feel really awkward because this should really should be your space where you can talk about how it feels and how you how you see things here from from your community, from this church, you know, from your faith. Maybe you guys have something you could offer. What do you reckon? How was the day? Great. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Getting together and just having a chance to have a prayer together and eat together. I thought it was fascinating. It's just very small, but we'd like to make that invitation. There are lots of people who would like to see that space happen. And uh, I know that you know, this is the first very small way to say that there are, there are many of us who are wanting to see that. But we have to choose for that to happen. Anyway, that's it. I'd like to pass on some information. Um, my name is Tanya Abed, and I come from Minnesota. And back over there, we uh, were going up against the uh, Enbridge Energy. Uh, they wanted to put the Sandpiper Pipeline through where I live. And I live like eight miles south of where they wanted to put that pipeline, right? So I went to their open houses. I started asking questions there. I got surrounded when I started asking for numbers. They were asking me what kind of numbers. I said, you know, everything that, you know, from the plants to the water, trees, you know, I want to get those numbers so that when that pipeline breaks, we can bring those numbers back up. Right? They didn't want to provide me numbers. Okay. Something about numbers with that, they, they, they just don't want to, you know, work it over, right? So, 
who had these open houses and these meetings that we had over at the Public Utilities Commission meetings. They were adamant about the first guy up on the stand with us. Well, you know, you need to let us through here. I was like, whoa, wait a minute now. We don't need to let you come through here, right? Because when that pipeline breaks, guess what? I live in the heart of the lands of where wild rice comes from. The food that grows on the water, right? And that's what sustained my people over that way is to be able to make it through the winter times. Because we didn't have the luxury of the buffaloes and stuff like that over here. You know, we had the wild rice on the lake. At these meetings, they told me, they gave me some, they told me about their um, safety system. They call it the pig system. <laughs> Our, yeah, it's called the pig system. I know it's got a goofy little name, but, you know, that's what they rely upon to tell them what's going to happen. You know, if there's a break in the line or something like that, or if there's a rupture going on and stuff like that, they, that, they, they say that the pig system is going to work for them. But, come to find out, when all these property owners decided, well, no, we can't, we don't want you on our property and whatever, right? So what they do is they put the pipeline through, but then they got to make these certain corners around these certain little, you know, just to be able to get across the property owner's lands. Now keep in mind that when they put some of these pig systems in these places, they don't necessarily fit where they are intended to be, right? So it could be on maybe, maybe two football fields down that they could probably put it in. But during that space and that space, there could be trouble. And they tell me that their response time is anywhere from three hours up to three days. Now, imagine during that time how much oil is going to be pumping out of that thing. They tell me that a pinhole leak is anywhere from 1.3 barrels to 28 barrels per minute. Per minute. And that kind of like, whoa, hey, hey, no, 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 we can't have this here. No, uh-uh. Especially not where I'm coming from, where wild rice is always growing. And to me today, with those little anomalies that have happened on that line three, the old line three, I can see it in the wild rice itself. Even down to how it cooks, how to, it breaks up, and how, to, and how we process it. Now, I've been watching the news and what happened down in Montana, where that oil spill happened down there, where they had to euthanize, what was it, over 300 buffalo or something like that. Case in point, over here by Dakota Access, this last April, May, I believe it was, when I was out here, 19 buffalo went dead. We tried to go over there to see what was going on with them, but, um, you know how it is to assume about things, you know. Did they really try to poison the gophers or those uh, prairie dogs or did, it, did the um, buffalo eat that, eat that poison so that they didn't have to worry about them? That was my question, anyways. Also, with um, Enbridge, I've been going up against these guys for the last five years. And they keep telling me, they keep giving me their facts. But when I go out and tell people about these facts that they told me, they tell me that it's all largely false. They call me the liar. Say, like, hey, now, I've got the information from you. With these pipelines, the life expectancy is anywhere from two to four years. If we take a look at the north and south runs, if we see how many, count how many pipeline bursts have been on those north and south, and not to mention the east and west ones, Two to four years is the life expectancy of those pipelines. And what they use, I asked Enbridge, what do you use in those pipelines? How can we don't get the best of the best of the pipelines so that, you know, whatever. So we don't have to worry about these because that's what they did back in the 50s and 60s. They put in, what was it, German or Japanese steel. Anyways, they made the pipes out of that stuff. And we know how well those brands of steel are in Germany and Japan, right? They're pretty good, right? Well, anyways, nowadays, what they use is recycled parts from cars, refrigerators, dishwashers, laundry, washing machines, dryers, to get all that together, and that's what they make the new pipes, pipelines out of. That plastic coating around the um, pipes that you see, it's all for the sun, so that it doesn't corrode the pipelines anymore than what it really is. So to me, 
You know, that's a big safety risk in my mind from where I come from, from where I stand. And for my love of Mother Earth, Wunchimaka, Imama Aking, I am Ojibwe, and I come here to help my relatives over here. I have nieces and nephews whose family originates from like the Rosebud and the um, Standing Rock reservations. And that's why I am here to help my family to be able to have the lands to come back to you so that they can have, enjoy that freedom that I had when I was a kid. And not to mention the grandkids and grandchildren and great grandchildren after them. You know, we need them to be able to enjoy that as well as everybody here in this building that wants to have that, you know, look outside, look at your pro at the plains. Where I grew up in, I got trees, trees galore. And I, miss, I do miss it, I do admit it, I miss it. But out here it is beautiful, it is very, very beautiful. And to see the water out that way, out this way, and how it moves and flows, to me that Arizona, he comes from the desert, and he appreciates waking up every morning to see the Missouri River there, to see the Cannonball River over on this side. We're in a place where it's mostly desert. You know, to me that was heart wrenching to know that he was going to go back home, quit his job, and come back up here to stand firm with us, to stand strong with us, to be able to protect good, clean drinking water for our future generations. So to me, with all these um, transfer places or energy transfer places, I don't trust their data. I don't trust anything like that from them. And I know for a fact, when that pipeline breaks, when it breaks, we're all gonna be paying the price. They tell us that they do uh, trainings for, uh, to, clean up, to clean up the pipeline stuff. I've had people in my community tell, come back and tell me, report back to me, that all it is is about, about um, crowd control. It has nothing to do about the cleanup. I also asked Enbridge also, okay, when that pipeline is underneath the water there, how many, how many scuba divers do you got? Yes. That can go down and check it down there. How many do you have on board, on hand, to be able to go in and check those um, breaks down there? Zero. None. So whatever floats up to the top, that's what they're um, hoping that we are able to catch catch that. But no scuba divers that can and handle that. And it's 90 feet underground. Exactly. Exactly. So how can we get that patched up then? Over at the Fond du Lac Reservation, they have pipes that are exposed overground. And when we were walking by that during for our sugar camp time, we go collect um, sugar from the trees and boil it down to maple sugar, right? So, as I was walking back to sugar camp, there was a spot probably about that big, and you could look into it and you could see that flow of oil going through there. Mm. Oh my goodness. And what they did was, a couple days later after we had said something about it, they put band-aid on grass. That was it. Okay, we're good to go, so let's go. So it's me. That's why I'm here, standing strong and standing rock, to be able to prevent what could happen, or what will happen. Once again, my name is Tanya Ovid, and I'm standing with you. Be great. Oh. So, as a member of this fellowship, uh, the frustrating pieces are the lack of fellowship and feeling of solidarity with others, other congregations, other people in this town. And so that's what we we're trying to do. We're at work, we're trying to do it. We're from here, we're trying to do that. But uh, the lack of a sense of relationships is um, uh, hurtful, and I'm hoping to change some lives. Thank you. So how about we just make an agreement that we'll all be here next Sunday? You're welcome. Everyone's welcome. Oh, <laughs> you got food. You <laughs> <laughs> can bring all the food you want. <laughs> <laughs> and we will. <laughs> so we'll go on the basis that we have to...
make the spaces or it doesn't happen. Because we know when we don't make the spaces, it doesn't happen. So if everyone, everyone can think about that, then over this next week we'll call again, all leading up to the 4th of December, where we hope to do and ask both your, your faith keepers and your clergy and your congregations to join us on the 4th of December. And that one will be inviting all our gracious hosts uh, standing around to be there so that we can look at this together and send another message. Thanks everybody for coming. I really enjoyed it. I feel weird saying that because I'm not even coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. I really enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs>
And for the one man who probably called, thank you very much. No, I didn't call. My oh, phone was dead. Yeah. <laughs> I got a dumb phone anyway. Can you confirm on Tuesday the time someone asked on for for the uh, medicine wheel? People are asking okay. if you can it's confirm. It's probably going to be when the daylight, when the sun rises, <laughs> somewhere between the sunrise and sunset. <laughs> my whole my invitation to you is to come to camp and walk with us. So instead of coming to say I got to be there at three o'clock or I got to be there at noon. How about say, when the sun rises, I'm going to go spend my day with the people who are fighting to protect the water. And when they all line up to go on that march, I'm going to line up with them. And when we march, we're all going to be in prayer. I'm going to pray with them. And then we all take our spots to wherever they tell us to go. So I would like to invite you, because I know everybody lives on time, but I want to live in spirit. I want you to walk over there. Or drive over there, walk into camp, and be with us that day in spirit and in prayer. That's what I would like to ask. So, sometime after the sun rises, head south. <laughs> when you're in camp, you will not miss it. Thousands of people will get up and they'll start walking. And that's what time it is. What day is that? Tuesday. Tuesday. This Tuesday. Solidarity day. Tuesday. Solidarity Day. Solidarity Day. International Solidarity Day. Can I? Yeah, right. One of my distant uh, elders in the community I'm a part of said that one chopping at the roots is worth a hundred beating at the branches. That's Henry <laughs> David Thoreau. And I'd like to know your thoughts about Bill McKibben's follow-up to that which is to uh, call Wells Fargo, call U.S. Bank, these other banks that are investing in these uh, terrible atrocities. And if you're uh, a subscriber to that bank, tell them you'll withdraw your money. If you're not, tie up their phone system. Let them know how you feel. <laughs> yeah, could you could you read that out? Uh, it is 202-456-1212. Say that again for us. Yeah. 202-456-1212. Hi right, guys, so you got to see a bit of uh, the question answer session. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up now because I'm going to head back to camp and then hopefully another occasion we'll be able to catch some of the different prayers that were shared, some of the different stories uh, from the different faiths um, that were shared. Um, but what was remarkable for me um, in all of this was whether it was from Sufi, whether it was from uh, Sufi Muslim, whether it was from India, whether it was from Christianity, whether it was from atheism, the general message was the same. And that is that we are guardians of this place. This place isn't ours to own. It's not separate from us. We are one with it. So every single, every single speaker was talking to that from a different standpoint, from a different belief system, but the message was exactly the same. We're not separate from nature. We are nature. And as long as we hold that belief that we're separate from nature, we will continue to rape the planet, we will continue to desecrate this place. But when we truly understand that what we do to the planet, we do to ourselves, that's the day we'll all come together and we'll be able to solve this. And that was the start of something here today. So thanks for joining, guys. Take care of yourselves and we'll be back with you soon.